I was ready to repurpose. That's what we just did with our solidarity flag. You know, often I get nervous when I get asked to speak at events because uh, of what I bring to the table. Uh, but then I remember I'm amongst family. This is my family, and in family, there's always different opinions, but always underlying everything is respect. And brothers and sisters, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about myself and what it is I do, and how I relate to each and every one of you in our everyday struggle that we have for worker rights. And as a good academic, I did prepare something, so I'm going to be reading a little bit, and uh, we'll go from there. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. It was morning I would greet you in the manner my parents greet other farm workers during the summer har harvest season. Que ¿Qué tal la cosecha? Which roughly translates to, how goes it? How's the harvest? Thank you all for attending and listening to some of my reflections on my topic today solidarity, inclusion, and justice for all, and how it relates to the election of 45 and our organizing efforts. But before I begin, I want to briefly introduce myself. Again, my name is Armando Ibarra, and first and foremost, I am a husband and a father of three children under three years of age. Wow. Yeah, three under three, I said that. All born here in Madison, Wisconsin. I earned my paycheck as a faculty member with the School for Workers and with what's called Chicano and Latino Studies at UW-Madison. And I am a proud and unapologetic member of my union, AFT, United Faculty and Staff, Local 223. <laughs> and I'm also uh, a uh, local organizing committee member of Voces de la Frontera, for those of you from the Milwaukee area or have been watching any type of social movement news nationally. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But before I continue, I want to situate myself in this conversation. This person, this political body in front of you, I will situate to how I fit. My great-grandparents and their generation were labor migrants. In the early 1900s, many of them were building the railroad tracks that connected east to west and south to north in basic industries like steel, mining and spelting, raw materials used to build the United States and Mexico's infrastructure during this historical period of modernization. Stories about their trials and tribulations have been passed down by our family elders, generation to generation. I remember hearing about my ancestors' experiences, experiences while migrating for work to places like Texas, California, Kansas, and Pennsylvania. I would become very sad and angry each time I heard about their dealings with labor exploitation, racism, and xenophobia. Many of the same issues immigrant and non-immigrant workers face today. My grandfather was a bracero. He and many of his family members and friends survived by working as imported farm laborers throughout the Southwest in the 1950s. The Bracero program was a wartime labor importation program negotiated between the U.S. and Mexico that began in 1942 and ended in 1964, almost two decades after the end of the war. Under this program, nearly 5 million Mexican males were contracted and imported as guest workers. They were mostly used in the agriculture industry. Braceros were barred from having any worker or labor rights. He was one of the millions of people that made up this cheap, exploitable, and deportable labor pool. One of the worries that I have is I often go into cul de sac moments, and uh, I'm going to just try not to do that because there's a lot that's going on today at the national level that points to an expanded form of a Bracero program that will be coming down the pipeline post. And that is an attack on labor rights for all of us here. My parents are labor migrants. They followed the historic labor trails to a norte that most of their family and home-type friends undertook and still follow. To this day, they continue to labor on agricultural farms in California, the same farms my grandfather worked. They have labored for over half a century, preparing and harvesting food for national and international consumption. Now, in their mid-70s, 
They cannot afford to retire because they belong to a racialized working but poor class. They will continue to work until their bodies no longer allow them to do so. I am a labor migrant. I was brought to the U.S. at the age of two and joined the family working unit at the age of four. Yes, folks, I've been working since the age of four. We worked in the same fields and orchards that were owned by the same growers my grandfather had labored in. I worked those fields until my early 20s. Don't ask me to go back now. First of all, I refuse, and second of all, I can't. My children are no longer labor migrants. Their stories will be different, but their lives are rooted in the political economic context that has been five generations in the making. My point here is simple. For many of us who are part of this working class subgroup, Labor migration is generational in a continuous process that spans over a century. We are not new or recent, as some folks might tell you. We are not foreign or alien. We are part of the labor and material used to fabricate the imaginary and physical tapestry of what is our America. In other words, brothers and sisters, we are labor and we belong. The election of 45. <clears throat> now I will share some of my thoughts on the recent presidential elections that led to 45. There is so much to say and do that I will focus on a couple of broad ideas and possible implications for working communities that have already been unleashed by 45. <coughs> but before, I would like to share that our son Armando Diego was born at 12.26 a.m. on November 9th. 2016 at Merida, a union hospital, 27 minutes after 45 was elected. Veronica, my partner, first, my wife, second. She made me say that, okay? <laughs> you know, and, and I'll say it. And I heard some of the election updates from nurses, doctors, and environmental service folks, the people that make the hospital work, right? The janitors and the housekeepers. Most expressed concern about what they were witnessing. A friend of mine, who is employed at the hospital and is a shop steward for the union there, visited, uh, visited us during his break and briefly updated us on the results. We were devastated and made a conscious decision to disconnect ourselves from popular news networks and other media outlets. We shut down, folks. We turned off the TV, we turned off the internet, we turned off the radio for several days after. I have been trying to make sense of many things since the election of 45, both personal and professional. I have been trying to understand how the national and state pollsters got it so wrong, and especially trying to unpack what this, what we know as the silent majority's message is for labor, marginalized community, and the world. I feel overloaded and overwhelmed with the amount of information from very credible and not so credible the newly minted fake media or news sources. I have sorted what I see as key themes that are arising within the current national narrative in the aftermath of the election. So for this is how, so far this is how I understand these national narratives. B, look at the numbers and who voted to help explain the election results in a post-organized labor and post-racial society. Those are very important terms that are used. The I told you so's. How many of you have heard the I told you so's? I have for sure. From the liberal left and extreme alt-right groups, the us versus them, coming from concerned immigrant and marginalized working communities and their allies, and the alt-right groups emboldened by the election outcome. The racism and structural racism narrative and fear of it becoming normalized into popular culture and governance processes. Again, folks, we are not a post-racial society. The system is broken and rigged when referring to Citizens United and the U.S. democracy. Capitalism in the future of new generation comes to an end. And here, I'm specifically talking about NAFTA. It's coming to an end, folks, and what's next? 
is scary. Her. He acquiesced now and that, that the election is over and move on and give democracy and the incoming administration a chance. The illegal and legal immigrants and those Muslims are the real threat narrative. And the next steps for the new administration and the pushback organizations and social movements, of which we are one. I am sure that I am missing several things, but these are enough for now. After this exercise of futility of attempting to read and sort, I continue to feel unsatisfied with my personal analysis of the election results and how they relate to labor. So, I did what I always do in my times of confusion and crisis. I reached out to my most trusted source, my mother. She listened to me as I expressed my concerns about how the rhetoric of hate was placed into action on January 20th, about my concerns for our community, future generations, labor, and the environment, about the deep sadness that I continue to feel to this day because of the attacks undocumented people and their families will face and the destruction and social disintegration those attacks will cause. Look to rural America and you will see social disintegration after this administration. And we can talk about more of that in, in the session. She continued to listen and let me go on for a while longer about other concerns and fears I have. And finally, I told her about having an exit strategy to Canada or Mexico or some other country where it is better. You've offered that, right? I'm going to Canada. <laughs> that we, we, people like me on this stage, on this stage, the privileged, often romanticize about escaping after such turmoil. Her response was simple and to the point. She said to me, Armando, this is our home. We struggle and fight for our family and communities here and now. We are not defined by hate and cannot hide or let fear dictate our actions. Armando, what you decide to do or not do will define you and your family for a long time. When I got off the phone, folks, I broke down. And this 210-pound man cried. So topics for today. So as I continue to reflect on today's topics, I continually found myself drifting back to my Mima's words and personal reflection. Topics that I thought would be interested, this is coming from the academic grade, included organized laborers in the Democratic Party's role in determining the 2016 presidential election outcomes. But we've heard that all already. Or the social process of racialization of working class ethnic and racial groups and how this process is foundational to capitalism and our neoliberal democracy. Or maybe briefly speak on the political economy of mass labor migration from Mexico to the U.S. in the last 100 years and how this labor migration has shaped today's America. Better yet, a short discourse on the continuing culture and identity versus working class politics debate and focus on the contradictions that exist in the labels that categorize and homogenize working communities in the laboring classes. We heard that in 2011, directly from, here I go, I'm going to get myself in trouble, uh, directly from, from, uh, from our governor, right? The plan was to divide and conquer. Or, of course, a short presentation on organizing power and the concept of powerlessness that can be used as a frame to analyze labor's contemporary position in the current political terrain. But I could not get over my mama's words and the flurry of childhood memories that resurfaced after the election. Memories full of pure childhood amazement, love, and absolute fear that I thought I had made peace with. So instead, I decided to share a couple of very personal memories with you today. Brothers and sisters, this is where I become vulnerable to you all. A memory of fear of the state. Memory one, 
One of my vivid childhood memories is of my first is of my first interaction with the Immigration Customs and Enforcement Agency, what we know as ICE, who we have always known as La Miga. I was six years old when I first understood that I belonged to a community considered to be part of the U.S. underclass, a working population whose labor is central to the economic well-being of our country, but whose cultural and political worth to civil society has been, for the most part, devalued. Our family was picking prunes in July at a farm in the Central Valley when yells of La Migra came from other working families. Green and white jeeps and vans were corralling us. We were being hunted and captured so that La Migra could check our immigration status. They wanted to process us and make sure we were not illegal aliens. Many of my loved ones and childhood friends were immediately detained while many ran and desperately looked for hiding places. One of my friends, who continues to be a part of my life, and very successful, $650 million successful, swam across the irrigation canal and walked six miles to the labor camp we all lived in. That's right, I said labor camp. I grew up on the migrant labor camp. I didn't understand at that time what was going on, but knew that I felt a profound fear that stays with me to this day. I was told by my oldest sisters that we would not see some family and friends for a long time or ever again. My family huddled in the middle of the prune orchard after the raid and hugged one another. A very sad and life-defining life moment for us. Memory number two. Word got to the labor camp that La Migra showed up at our local high school and rounded up students who they suspected as illegals. This was a, any student profile as looking Mexican. Anybody that looked like me, or not, was rounded up. My oldest sister was one of those students detained and was questioned and released. My mother, to this day, swears she was released because of divine intervention <coughs> caused by the many prayers to La Virgen de Guadalupe. She does two rosaries a day, and that's what she attributes this to. I believe she outweighed the edges because, because we had learned to pass and fold them with her almost perfect English. Or maybe it was as simple as having her papers. Other students who were not U.S. citizens or did not have legal immigration status weren't so lucky. Or maybe they forgot to pray. Many of them were deported and never returned to school or to our community. I don't know the fate of some of those students, but the ones that returned never fully recovered from that act of state-sanctioned violence. We didn't show up to the labor camp bus stop for many days after the high school media raid. Our family, our family and community was fractured and paralyzed by fear. When we did return, we were bullied and intimidated and constantly made to understand that we were not welcome. This was very confusing to me because this place was home. The bullies were of all ages, ethnicities, and races, and occupied very important positions in my community. They included people who looked and spoke like me, who had immigrated to the U.S. like us, but who saw us as different because of how we worked to survive. At the age of six, I knew that this was wrong. I understand firsthand what it means to be a member, a member of a mixed-status immigrant working-class family and community during difficult times. I understand how state-sponsored racism and xenophobia manifest themselves in the form of fear and anxiety in working-class immigrant communities. <coughs> but folks, I refuse to accept these as normal. I refuse to believe that we, the collective we in this room, are quickly losing our humanity, moving away from inclusiveness and welcoming exclusion. We fought back against normalizing of othering by organizing our community. Growing up, we didn't care about the immigration status or birthplace of one another. We cared and considered folks is the purest form of solidarity. A willingness to act with and on behalf of your sisters and brothers because you share a history that is bonded by your working class experience. 
This, folks, is how I define solitary and how I live my life. With time, I found myself as a member of multiple communities with people from all walks of life, occupation, ethnic, and racial groups who share similar social, economic, and political views and understand the power of organizing. In short, folks, I found you all. I found organized labor. Where I first interned and worked on a long-term community labor organizing command, uh, campaign in the Sacramento area, creating uh, a working but poor coalition that was very successful with helping organize the tribes there. Then I worked as an organizer in training, a newly minted title within labor to, uh, to get us to work a little bit more for a little bit less. Um, and I can talk to you all outside in the hallway about what that means. Then as an organizer for, the, for an international union, several locals, where I worked on multiple private and public organizing drives. Then as an organizer of organizers, the concept that maybe organizers have working rights and labor rights as well, that didn't end too well. Yeah, I got a couple of chuckles because you know what I'm talking about. And currently, as a faculty member of the School for Workers, where our mission is to provide education for workplace democracy. Again, education for workplace democracy. Folks, that just means unionized workplaces in a fancy way. They say that the best organizer is always the boss. I am a firm believer that a residual a residual of a well-organized and conscious working class community is civic participation, of which elections are only a small, are only a small but important part. There is power in organized responses during difficult times. We must continue to organize locally and escalate nationally and once again build a social movement that will ultimately lead to humane societal change. 45 has given us common ground and a renewed purpose to do so. We continue to build. Almost done. I'm just glad I'm not up to lunch. Cesar Chavez was once asked, for those of you who do not know who Cesar Chavez is, he is possibly the most celebrated labor leader in our country's history outside of labor, right? I, I think I said that correctly. He was asked, how did you build, how did you all build the UFW? His response was simple, one person at a time. So we built our movement one person at a time because of what brings us together. And that is that we all earn a paycheck and we all share a common purpose. So when asked, what can we, we, as labor do, my answer is simple. Organize. Now I'm going to go into one school disciple next week. Isn't organizing one of the easiest things to talk about and then one of the hardest things to do? Yeah. Because we've got to convince folks that they need to put their life on the line. That's what it's about. It's to organize and join communities who are currently organizing. Only in this manner will we continue to build our base that can be mobilized for power. So I ask, if not us, as labor, who? If not now, when we're facing a crisis, when? On May 1st, tens of thousands of folks from diverse working communities will take to the streets across the country. Voces de la Frontera from Milwaukee has emerged as the national leader in the effort to push back against attacks on immigrant and working communities. Let's join and make a bold statement that labor will fight and build alongside our community allies and non-organized workers. Folks, onward and forward something that I learned in Wisconsin. And thank you in solidarity, sisters and brothers.